Hi everyone, welcome to our talk and welcome to everyone watching online and also in the hub in Stockholm. Uh, I'm about to introduce Walt Meyer, who's from the National Snow and Ice Data Center at the University of Colorado, and he's going to talk to us about sea ice projections and what the past can teach us about the future of Arctic sea ice. Take it away, Walt. All right, uh, thank you, Robbie, for the introduction. And uh, yeah, so I'll uh, talk a bit about uh, some of the observations and, uh, and, and what we've seen. And then uh, Robbie is also going to uh, uh, join. We, we uh, joined uh, slide, so I apologize for not putting his name here. This is kind of a, a, a co-presentation. Um, so anyways, uh, let me first, uh, for those that aren't familiar with the National Snow and Ice Data Center, um, we're a group at the University of Colorado. Um, and uh, we do a lot of uh, research in sea ice and in snow and other areas of the cryosphere. Um, and uh, also uh, interact, uh, we have some projects that interact with local communities and local knowledge, and also uh, manage a lot of data for the cryosphere. And uh, one of the areas that I'm involved with is the NASA data center uh, called the Distributed Active Archive Center. It's one of 12 data centers within the, uh, within the US, within NASA. Um, and we're archiving uh, a lot of the NASA satellite data, including like the uh, long-term records of sea ice from passive microwave instruments and uh, sea ice uh, thickness observations and ice sheet thickness from uh, ISAT, ISAT-2, for those that are familiar with that. So um, I'm going to start uh, kind of just with a, a picture of the change that I think uh, really just shows dr dramatically how things change. This is a... Uh, this is ice age. Um, so this is the age of the ice in the Arctic. Um, this starts here in 1984. I'll just start it here. Um, the ice drifts around with with the winds and currents, as you probably know. Um, and you know, it's if it stays in the Arctic through a summer melt season, it ages one year. So you get the multi-year and the older ice, and that's in white here. So you can see that the uh, the ice is drifting around uh, with the winds and the currents. It, uh, you know, it expands in the winter, it, de it uh, decreases in the summer. And as you watch this, uh, particularly as you get into the 90s here, you start to see the older ice, the white area, start to decrease. Um, there's kind of a, a pulse of ice going out along the Fram Strait and the, along the coast of Greenland, the east coast of Greenland there, uh, between uh, Greenland and Svalbard. Um, and that's typical, but we, what we saw was a big pulse in the, in the early 90s and to the mid-90s that uh, really dumped out a lot of the older ice that didn't get replenished fast enough. And it started to come back a little bit in the 2000s here. You know, essentially, you can kind of think of this as like the, the bathtub. Uh, you know, you got ice you know, coming in at the top and then draining out the bottom. But what's happened is, the, is we're seeing here as we get into the mid-2000s, and you really start to see it in 2005. Uh, we're losing a lot more multi-year ice than it's getting replenished uh, as the first-year ice that survives and, and ages. Um, you also start to see it north of Alaska and the Beaufort and Chukchi Sea right here, um, the circulation of, of scattered multi-year ice that actually melts out uh, within the Beaufort and Chukchi Sea, which is uh, something that's really a dramatic change. Typically, the Beaufort Gyre, the circulation in the north of Alaska, spins the ice around and, and helps it age over several years. Um, but it's just not lasting uh, like it used to. So again, uh, this is now 2015, um, and you really start to see even more, even more ice loss and even more melt. Um, and so this is now where we're at. This goes through 2019, uh, at the end of 2019. So you know now the the multi ice is really constrained, just right along the coast of Greenland, between Greenland and the North Pole, and along the Canadian Archipelago by and large, and everything. Uh, particularly in the Siberian seas and the Siberian side, uh, has basically become all seasonal ice. Um, this is another, uh, just another way of looking at it. This is a different color scale. Um, it's probably a little hard to see the, uh, the labels there, um, but on the left is 1985 at the end of summer, right at the end, right at the minimum. And the red is the four plus year old ice. Uh, so over four years old. And you can see a significant part of the Arctic Ocean is covered by that ice. In 1985, and then this is just this past uh, end of this past summer in 2021 and early September, and you can hardly see any red there at all. Um, 
it's in a lot of the blue, which is the first year ice, uh, the ice that is not yet, uh, that j is just surviving one summer melt season here. And then in the bottom is a plot of uh, the actual extent. Um, and what we see is the multi-year ice decreasing as well as the oldest ice, the oldest component of that. So the multi-year ice is anything that survived one summer melt season. And then the, the red is uh, the greater than four years old. And you really see, you know, in 2005 and 2007, some really big drops where there wasn't replenishment of multi-year ice. And in the multi-year ice, it's interesting. Um, I, I think it's still uh, kind of, uh, there's, there's interesting uh, things we can look at here. But it, we've had lows. This year was the second lowest in, in the record, um, just, be, just above 2012. And they're all kind of bouncing at the threshold of about 1.25, but it goes up and down as well there, as you can see. So there's been this kind of cycle a little bit, two or three years of some recovery and then goes back down. But if you look at the ice that's greater than four years old, it's been pretty flat and, and below a half million square kilometers since 2008. Um, and so what's happening is there is some recovery from year to year uh, or some uh, oscillation from year to year, some multi-year ice. Some years the, the multi-year ice really just disappears, uh, and then some years more of it is retained and stays around, but none of it is really staying around more than four years. So eventually it is either being advected out of the Arctic or melting out. And that's a really different uh, Arctic environment than what we used to have back in the 80s. Um, you can see you know, the, the four-year-old ice used to be well over a million, million and a half, even at its lower point. Um, and even higher, about two and a half million square kilometers uh, in the uh, mid 80s. And, and that doesn't even, you know, uh, this is just grouping all ice lower than four, four years. Um, it was not at all unusual for ice to be 10 years old in the Arctic Ocean. Um, and now that, that ice, again, is, is almost completely disappeared. Um, so we're just not getting the ice lasting long like it used to. Um, Another uh, thing to look at is the ice volume. So ice age is kind of a proxy for thickness and for volume. The older ice is thicker, it has more volume. Um, so it's a nice record because we don't have good satellite records of thickness and volume. The other way we can get at volume or thickness is from modeling. Um, and then this is, so this is from the University of Washington Polar Science Center, uh, they call the PIO mass model. Um, and this shows a similar trend. So what they're doing here, it does use observations. It uses sea ice concentration from satellite data and integrates that into the model. And the model is actually calculating the volume and the thickness. So it's not a pure observation, but it does, uh, it is constrained by observations. And again, you can see, uh, you know, ups and down a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, oscillation, but a general downward trend. But since about 2010, 2011, it's been more stable um, with, uh, with not as clear of a trend. Um, and then this is again here, um, looking at the April, just the April trend and the September trend. Um, and we've lost uh, in September about two thirds of the volume. Um, if you look at the linear trend from uh, about, or almost two thirds from about 17,000 uh, uh, cubic kilometers to about 6,000, five to 6,000 cubic kilometers. Um, also, I just wanna look, point out thickness quickly here. Um, you know, we don't have as good of thickness records. There's been some that have put together from submarines from the from the 70s, some scattered uh, satellite data in, in the early uh, 2000s. Um, but since 2010, um, we now are getting pretty regular basins, basin wide observations, at least during the winter time, uh, observations of sea ice thickness from which we can get sea ice volume. So the top is the cryosat two. Um, and it's combined with a passive ra radiometer to get thinner, uh, the thinner sea ice areas. And 2019-2020 uh, was, uh, was much below normal. Um, and, and among the lowest, in, in, for part of it, was the lowest in the 10-year uh, the record. It's still a very short record. Um, and uh, a, a preview, uh, I've seen the new data for 2020 and 2021, um, but it's not out yet. It's going to be released with the Arctic report card. Um, but it also shows pretty extreme low. So, you know, again, we're seeing even since 2010, low volumes. And now we also have another independent uh, since 2018, the NASA ISAT 2 uh, altimeter, which also there's only about four years record, but if you compare it with other earlier data, um, again, the ice is much thinner. There's less volume than it used, there used to be. 
Um, so now uh, kind of coming to kind of the more iconic, the more uh, our, our long term sea ice extent, which is we have a lot more complete data, more confidence in um, going all the way back to 1979 with the satellite record. And folks have probably seen this. This is this is your September sea ice extent shows the linear trend there. Um, um, you know, this has been followed quite quite a bit over the years um, and we update this every year. Um, but I wanted to look at it and show it a little bit different way. Um, this is the same data, um, but now uh, I broke it down into uh, different uh, regimes, uh, different periods. So the first period, 14 years from 1979 to 1992, and then the second period from 1993 to 2006, and then the fourth period two, is 2007 to 2021. So the first two periods are 14 years, and the last one is 15 years. Um, and you can see, you know, each year, each period is lower, has a lower average than the than the previous period, and particularly the 2007 to 2021 uh, is much lower. And in fact, 2007 to 2021, those 15 years are the lowest 15 years in the record. Um, they've been lower than anything. Everything 2006 before is above what we've seen in the last 15 years. Um, so, you know, the last 15 years again shows a pretty dramatically changed uh, Arctic. Uh, conditions with much lower extents, but um, there's been there is a lot of variability from year to year, uh, even within these within these short periods. And if you look at the trends, which are the dashed lines, um, you know there's a, a, a good a reasonable trend in from the 79 to 92, um, and even steeper trend from 93 to 2006. Um, that one's actually statistically significant at the 95% level. It's hard to be, get statistical significance from a 14 or 15 year record. Um, but, uh, but even steeper over uh, 87,000 square kilometers per year um, during that period. Um, so that's a big chunk of the overall 79 to 2021 trend of 81,000 uh, square kilometers per year. But what's I think interesting 2007 to, to 2021, the trend is essentially zero. Um, it's essentially been flat. Uh, just barely negative, not at all statistically significant there. Um, and it's, you know, it's interesting, um, you know, it includes 2007, which is a record low. And, and of course, that's part of this, you know, I, I'm, I want to caution here, this is only a 15 record. And, you know, you can very much cherry pick in a sense of, of what you're doing uh, to, to get different trends. And that's why it's not statistically significant. And you're starting with 2007, which was a record low. But I think it still is interesting in that, you know, those those low years, um, we've had some ups and downs, but we've never we haven't surpassed 2012 since then. Um, uh, not not to brag too much, uh, but I actually uh, in 2012, I, I don't have a record of this, but I, I did actually say this in 2012. I, I said after the 2012 record, I said, I think this might very well be the record in 2022 still. In my mind, it's too surprising because there's a lot of variability. We lost so much ice in 2020, 2012 and 20, 2007 um, that you're you're unlikely to get such extremes um, so soon again. Um, so it's basically flat. Um, I'll just show you uh, March here, which is when we have the maximum. Shows a little bit different. Um, again, you see this step down in the averages. Each each period is lower than the previous one. But the the trends are, are a little more uh, are more stable. We have significant trends in each of the period, um, even though they're shorter periods. The ninety three, the middle period, ninety three to two thousand and six, is is a little steeper, um, but it's it's not near as much variability in the in the than compared to twenty twenty one. So now this uh, gets into yeah. I started looking start looking at the trend. This is the trend value square kilometers per year um uh a thousand square kilometers per year here um starting in 1979 so each of these data points is the trend starting in 1979 through the year of the data point so the first one is 1986 so that's the trend from 1979 to 1986 then 1979 to 1987 and so on so at the beginning of the record it's shorter um so there's uh, there's a there's uh you know a lot more variability and the, the bars there are the standard two standard deviation range of the trend. Um, so that's basically an indication of the significance, or the uncertainty of your trend, basically, and, and the significance. So when, the, when those bars cross the zero line, 
that's where you you can't say statistically significant you have a, a negative or a positive trend. Um, so starting in September for September in 1999, we're consistently below uh, zero. So we have a statistically significant trend um, since 1979, and you can see. You know, it kind of calms down. Of course, as you add more years, there's less variability. You know, it's less any individual year is going to change things less. Um, but again, you get a pretty good downward trend. You know, essentially, that means there's an acceleration in the trend. The trend magnitude is increasing over time until you get to about 2012. And then it's been pretty stable since then, right around 80,000 square kilometers per year, a decreasing trend. Um, and you look at March, similarly, uh, except it's even more stable, really. Um, it's about 40,000 square kilometers per year ice loss in, in March. Um, and again, that's been pretty stable. So, uh, you know, you see variability year to year, but long term, things look pretty, pretty stable. Um, and um, so, again, you, you could just naively and you know, there's a lot of, and, and Robbie will talk in a minute about projections and some of the model projections. Um, and that's what a lot of the, the focus on. I'm not a modeler, so I tend to look at things kind of simplistically from the observations. So this is just looking purely from observations. Um, and again, there's the data in black. And those bars is the, is the detrended two standard deviation range. So that's kind of like the expected variability uh, on any given year around the linear trend. And the, the gray line is the linear trend line. And the linear trend line crosses 1 million square kilometers in 2062, actually, um, it just based on, on that. And 1 million square kilometers is kind of the, the threshold for ice-free conditions. Um, essentially, you, know, you get to about 1 million square kilometers, you're, you're getting into the ice that's right along the, the coast of Greenland within the Canadian archipelago, really thick ice that's not likely to allow melt out. Effectively, you have a blue Arctic Ocean at that point. Um, and so that's what's been kind of accepted as a, as a good threshold for what we mean by quote unquote ice free, because we're probably never going to get to totally ice free. Um, there's going to be a little you know, protected areas. There's going to be some thick ice that will hang around, um, you know, even in even in warm summers, at least for many decades into the future. Um, but one million square kilometers is something that's a good threshold, I think. And so you know, you get about 2062, but there's a big range based on that that uh, st standard deviation between 2049 and 2075. And so this gives you a sense that there's, you know, people focus on the year a lot and, and are interested, when's the Arctic going to be ice-free? I get that question a lot. Um, and it's a really hard question to answer in terms of uh, what year it's going to be, because there's this variability um, that we just don't know. And so you know, the best we can do is plus or minus maybe 10 or 15 years, really. Um, and that uncertainty, there, there's also other uncertainties with this as well. Uh, there's this paper by, by Lique, um, it's about five years ago now, but I, I really like this figure um, because it, it gives you uh, what the uncertainties are kind of in a nice visual way. The internal variability in blue, that's, that's, the, that's the variability of the, of the sea ice conditions from year to year. So that's what I showed here. Uh, that's essentially equivalent to, to what those error bars are there. Um, it's the variability, the inherent variability within the system. Um, and that's going to be consistent pretty much throughout. Um, and then there's the model itself, the model structure, whatever assumptions or biases, you know, that are incorrect, incorrect assumptions or simplifications or biases in the model. Those will, those, that effect grows over time. That's in green. So you see that spreading out. And then there's the forcing scenario, and that that's really you know what emission pathway are we going to take, um, and that obviously has an effect as well. So as you go into the future, you know your your uncertainties get quite large, um, even you know beyond the internal variability, and so that really leads to the sense of you know what. In, in a lot of ways, we shouldn't focus uh, as much on the the year. Everyone's interested in the year, and it's certainly fascinating. It will be an iconic moment, but. Um, you know what's really happening is it's the long-term response to uh, to the climate, to temperature, to greenhouse gas forcing. Um, that's really the the more important aspect. And so now we'll go into the projections and the in the actual model projections. And Robbie will come up and talk about those. Um, and then I'll finish up with a few final thoughts as well. So, Robbie.
Thanks, Walt. I just want to go back to this this linear slide for for a minute that, that linearly extrapolates the the CS extent because there's there's a lot of value in that and and I think it's really interesting to see that when you just draw the line down you, you get ice free by 2050 to 2075 somewhere in that region but when you run these more complex models you you start to see curvature and it's not just a straight line down the models actually actually have a curve and they kind of accelerate downwards. Um, and and it's, it's useful to just vaguely understand why that is, why, why we do see that, that increased rate of, rate of decline. And that's a lot to do with Arctic feedbacks. So as the ice disappears, you, you start to expose dark ocean. And when the sun shines on that dark ocean, the ocean absorbs the heat. Whereas if it were to hit ice, that sunlight it would be reflected back out into space. And there are a couple of other slightly more complex and less intuitive feedbacks of, of that type. So uh, we're changing this, the vertical structure of the atmosphere in the Arctic quite a lot as we warm it. Um, and those, those mean that we can't necessarily just draw a straight line through the data and we do need to run these complex models to see what the impacts of, of our policy choices are, what, what the impacts of 1.5 and 2 degrees are on, on the, the Arctic Ocean and, and the state of uh, the, the, the higher northern hemisphere, really. So looking back, looking back to this, uh, I just want to just to cue you up with, we really do ultimately have a choose your own adventure scenario here where we get to decide what happens to the Arctic in the next uh, the next 80 years, really. Um, but as we see it warm, we're, we're going to start to see ice-free regions, first of all, in summer, as might make sense. And the width of those ice-free seasons is going to increase into the shoulder seasons of October. And, and it's going to certainly damage the, the autumn shoulder season much more quickly than it begins to damage the spring uh, the spring shoulder season. But again, if we do keep warming to 1.5 degrees, you'll see that, that we can, uh, we can stop a, a, a nice free Arctic, but there is some uncertainty in, in all of this. Uh, it's, it's also worth saying that the variability means that we might actually see some ice free summers before we see consistently ice free summers in the same way that the world will, uh, almost certainly exceed 1.5 degrees of, av of, of warming. Uh, before it does so on average. So we need to not confuse variability and an instantaneous crossing of the threshold with uh, a mean state crossing of the threshold. Uh, I, I also just want to address these CMIP5 models. I'll stay on the previous slide and the CMIP6 models uh, because we tend to use ensembles of models. So lots of different modeling groups have their own models and they perform very differently. Some perform better, some perform worse. And, and they don't just generally perform better uh, for all Earth systems or none of the Earth systems. Some are really good at sea ice and, and really bad at, at tropical rainforests, for instance. Uh, but currently, the, the sort of broad approach is to basically weight all these models equally in the, in the CMIP stream of work. Um, but if you, if you actually choose which models represent the sea ice more effectively, so the models that represent historical conditions better, you, we've recently started to see that we see ice-free summers sooner and possibly as soon as 2035. So there was some really nice work from David Dockier and, and Koenig uh, recently out on, on that, that that raised the 2035 date for those of you that are following ice-free summers and, and when that might happen. So here's that choose your own adventure plot. If we hold 1.5 degrees, uh, we really can, can radically uh, change the situation uh, relative to two degrees. So 1.5 degrees in this plot is represented by the crosses and two degrees is represented by the, the circles or, or the dots. And you can see that the Arctic warming um, really, really is, is sensitive to the, the global mean, uh, but it is also amplified from the global mean. So the Arctic is currently warming at three times the global average rate. Uh, and that's for reasons that I discussed earlier involving uh, feedbacks like, uh, like the ocean becoming exposed and the changing atmospheric structure. Uh, but but I, I also do just want to caution that although that we do see that that curve curve downwards rather than just a straight line towards an ice free ocean. There are also negative feedbacks. So for instance, as the sea ice begins to thin, uh, the atmosphere becomes much more connected with the ocean and it actually becomes easier for the sea ice to grow in winter. So we're not at the risk of a, a catastrophic tipping point. The phrase tipping point is often thrown around, uh, in, in my view, perhaps carelessly by, by pundits and, and, and honestly concerned people. Um, but, but, we're not looking at a catastrophic loss due to these positive feedbacks because there are also key negative feedbacks in place. But, but the big story is that we can, we can make decisions right now about how this evolves and, and what 1.5 and 2 degrees will, will mean for Arctic warming and, and also Arctic sea ice.
Finally, uh, here's just a plot from this CMIP6 exercise. So just to remind some of you that might not be up to speed on the CMIP program, uh, it, it stands for Coupled Model Intercomparison Project. So lots of groups get their models together and we, we try and hash out what's, what's going to happen in future based on a mission scenario. And these SSP acronyms, those are the new uh, iteration of the IPCC emission scenarios, essentially. So that stands for Shared Socioeconomic Pathway. And, and you can treat those broadly similar to what used to be representative concentration pathways. And you'll actually see that they share some of the numbers. So 8.5, 4.5, and 2.6. You can look at 8.5 as the high emission scenario, 4.5 as a moderate emission scenario, and 2.6 as a, a low emission scenario. Although I'm talking on the Friday of, of COP and uh, the, the sort of tectonic plates of emission scenarios are sort of shifting beneath our feet slightly. So pe people are now, are now saying that because there's, there's if countries stick to their NDCs, we'll, we have about a 50% chance of keeping it under two degrees. It, it's possible that in the literally the last two days, we've, we've started to shift the dial away from this 8.5 scenario, which previously we would refer to as high emissions, but also some, including me, would maybe have said business as usual, but, but now business as usual has perhaps changed. And, and don't, be, don't be fooled by this plot. This is the CMIP6 plot. And, and it looks a lot like the impact of the high emission scenario in red it's kind of the same as, as the medium and the low emission scenario, but it's really important to, to remember that this is surface temperature change on the x-axis. So this isn't time. This isn't, oh, it's all going to be the same in time. It's, it's all going to be the same with, this, with the same. It's, it's all just going to work out the same. Uh, the high emission scenario does still almost obviously result in, in higher global temperatures. So with the high emission scenario, you see we do push it much further to the right. Uh, the, the red band extends much further to the right, up to five degrees of of, of surface temperature change and, and that results in much greater losses of, of sea ice. Um, I think that's my last slide. So I'm gonna hand back over to Walt. Oh no, it's not, it's not my last slide. So, so another key thing on these feedbacks is, um, as I said earlier, we're not, we're not at risk of some catastrophic tipping point in the Arctic Ocean such that if we start to lose sea ice very quickly, then it'll all just disappear within a few years. And there's a really nice, nice paper on this, a really nice model-based investigation where you can actually, in, in model world, remove all the sea ice periodically. Every 20 years, you can just tell the model, all of the sea ice is gone. Uh, and it turns out that summer sea ice does actually recover uh, because it still forms in winter. Winters are still very cold because it's just dark at the North Pole and, and, and no amount of climate change is, is going to stop it from being dark in winter at the North Pole. Uh, so we can sort of take some heart from this graph that you can see sea ice extent does decline uh, in line with what we project. But were we to have an extremely bad year where we uh, lost, in the extreme case, all of the sea ice, we do see a recovery of summer sea ice. Uh, and what really dictates what happens in the long term is our emission scenario. So do we, do we emit a lot, of, a lot of carbon? Do we warm the globe and warm the Arctic? Or do we hold back and keep the Arctic safe? And we're not necessarily at the mercy, as far as uh, blue ocean events or, or sea ice-free summers go, we're not at the mercy of this internal variability. We're not at the mercy of chaotic weather. We do get to decide how the Arctic evolves. Oh, I, should, I should also just say that this is not the case for winter sea ice. So summer sea ice recovers, but if we warm the globe to the point where the winter sea ice begins to disappear, then we really are in trouble because it's winter when all the sea ice forms. Uh, and if you remove your ability to actually create sea ice in winter, then you do start to see pretty catastrophic losses of, of sea ice in summer. So the, the summer, the ice-free summer situation, choose your own adventure. And the, and the winter is, is also true, but if we start to degrade our ability to produce sea ice in winter, um, the, the Arctic will truly fundamentally change. Uh, I'll pass back to Walt now. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'll just keep it on here just for a second. I think just to follow up on Robbie's comments there, one of the things I, I think that's good about this and, and, it was, and also about sea ice in general, um, it's it's been kind of a poster child for you know for climate change and, and how dramatic it is and and you know climate change is gonna it's gonna remove all the summer Arctic sea ice and the polar bears are gonna die, um, but I think sea ice is also in some ways kind of a hopeful uh, thing because um, it is very sensitive to the climate and to the warming and, and ultimately to the to the emissions. So if uh, even if we do eventually lose uh, the summer sea ice, um, if 
we change behavior, we change submissions, um, get to carbon neutral, um, it will come back. Um, the temperatures will decrease, the sea ice will come back, and it will come back pretty quickly. Um, uh, it'll take a little longer for thickness to, to build up to the way it used to be in the 80s, but the sea ice cover uh, will recover, uh, you know, will come back. Um, and so I think that's a, a hopeful thing and an important thing to keep in mind. Uh, you know, sometimes you hear like, well, you know, climate change is so extreme and everything's good. Sea ice is going to disappear. There's nothing we can do about it. So why even worry about it? Um, I think the sea ice is a good lesson in that, you know, there are things we can do um, to, uh, to, to, to stabilize things and even bring things back. So um, I just wanted to make that point. Um, so I just wanted to finish up, you know, we're kind of talking, we've been talking, you know, about um, the kind of the, the hemispheric scale, uh, the whole Arctic sea ice and a lot of the projections um, you know, focus on what's the Arctic overall Arctic sea ice to to the temperature increases, and as Robbie talked about. Um, but I also I want to bring it at the end here just a little bit to to regional. Um, you know, there's there's regional trends. One of the things with the Arctic that is uh, with the sea ice is that it is completely pan Arctic in terms of the ice losses. Um, you can't read these uh, numbers, but the main point to show here, this is just the, the X axis across is January through December. So these are monthly and everything zero is at the top. So everything's negative. There are no positive trends um, in the Arctic sea ice. No matter what region you look in, um, you have negative trends. And you know some of them are zero, but that's where it, in winter it's completely ice covered. So there's no variability or it's in summer when it's always ice free. So there's no variability. But any place you have variability in the ice cover, any location and, and time of year or month, um, you have negative trends. Um, and so I think that, you know, really shows how widespread that is. And it, I think it also, you know, you look at this map and you think about the, the losses in the ice cover. Um, those losses are, are different in different locations and they're going to be different in the future. So I think it's worth... Uh, Thinking about, uh, you know, when we talk about projections, thinking about regional and the regional impacts of those projections, um, you know, ice-free conditions will come at different times in different place, places and in different ways and will have different impacts on, on communities and, and people and, and ecosystems there. Um, you know, the indigenous communities, hunting, fishing, you know, it's, it's where the ice is and when it disappears and when it comes back near their communities um, and, you know, where the storms track um, during the, the longer season and will it affect the coastal erosion. There's obviously, you know, national security issues and commercial activities, you know, where the ice opens up will decide where you might be able to start shipping, you know, reliably. Um, you know, for example, the northern sea route along the coast of Siberia is already pretty open um, and it's becoming a pretty reliable, especially during summer, uh, shipping lane. The Northwest Passage still has a lot of thick ice. It has opened up, but it's not very reliable, and it's a it's a narrow and shallow channels. So you know that that has effects. There's also the potential you, to get to the point in the Central Arctic where you could do a cross Arctic shipping uh, if the if the ice retreats across further further north and, and towards the uh, the North American side. Um, and then uh, another aspect is um, seasonal predictions. You know the focus here course is on the at cop is is on the long-term response um but i did want to uh, draw attention a little bit to seasonal projections and again this kind of gets to the community impacts um you know the the long term obviously is 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 important but and you know what's going to happen this year is also very important to the communities there and and if there's ways we can improve that um, that would be really helpful, especially as things have changed so much that the old ways of and the old kind of standard uh, norms no longer apply. So having skillful seasonal forecasts will become, I think, more and more important uh, as as the long term change continues to happen. And I've been involved with uh, what's called the Sea Ice Prediction Network, um, which runs the, what's called the Sea Ice Outlook, which is seasonal um, September sea ice uh, predictions. Um, this is just an example of our predictions um, of 2021 with the straight line at the top um, uh, being the, the observed this year. And you can see everything was quite low this year. Um, um, I wouldn't worry about the details, but those are all the different types of projections or predictions. Um, and so, you know, we're not doing too good of a job um, overall. 
one of the things that, that's interesting that came out, that's come out of this so far, um, this is a little bit too complicated of a plot probably to show here, but um, this it basically is what we, what we found is the, if you take last year's observation, what, what the sea ice was last year, the predictions tend to map, the tends for the next year tend to map to that. So what's happening is the prediction methods are somehow biasing themselves to the previous year or kind of anchoring themselves. You know, this is anchoring is kind of a very typical thing when people are estimating things personally, but uh, you know, and you can maybe guess from statistical methods that that might happen or heuristic where again, people are kind of guessing, but it actually even happens with physical models um, which shouldn't have any kind of bias or any, there's no real relationship between the previous, but they still show. So there may be something where the models are being tuned that are kind of, uh, affect the, to, or initialize that it's affecting things. Um, so what it indicates is, you know, we've still got a lot to learn um, and a lot to uh, improve on to come up with more reliable um, seasonal forecasts. It is a very challenging uh, thing and, and we're kind of just getting started, I think. Um, but the other thing that we're also looking at is tying these again to the, the needs of the local uh, communities, uh, you know, in, in regional, who, what kind of information do stakeholders need? Um, so I think that's uh, something that we're really looking to try to do in the future. Um, so uh, just to summarize, um, you know, the observations, you know, showing a consistent linear trend, um, as Robbie said, you know, we, it's not likely to follow a linear trend. Things are likely to accelerate um, so that that simplified linear projection is probably not, uh, it's probably too conservative, but, um, but again, you know, we expect this kind of direct relationship between CO2 and temperature. Um, and that's what we're seeing in the observations. Um, you know, in terms of years, what year would the projection will happen? There's, there's a pretty wide range because of the variability and the uncertainty of the models, but really it's responding to temperature. It's responding to the, the CO2 level, um, and, and that's what's going to control things long term. And what year it actually happens is going to be subject to the variability from year to year. Um, you know, when when people ask, you know, when, what year is the Arctic sea ice going to be free? Yeah, it's free. Um, again, I think it's not a great question in a lot of ways. I mean, it's certainly interesting. It's iconic. Um, but just even ice cream in and of itself is not all that interesting because it's not like you flip a switch, you know, it's, it's a, that 1 million threshold. It's just a number that you're crossing. It's not a fundamental change in the Arctic. It's changed. It's already changed. Um, and will continue to change. It's already a vastly different Arctic. Um, and the sea ice age is just one example of, of how different it is. Um, and, and like I said, the, the new environments presents challenges, um, just challenges, just, uh, you know, uh, adapting to it, but also in, in prediction. Um, so I just want to thank, uh, Pam, Pearson and the ICCI for the invitation and the support uh, and inviting me to do this and uh, thank Robbie for uh, his contribution as well for this. So thanks. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Oh, several. Okay. Let's, let's have this gentleman at the back. Uh, uh, yeah. If you could come up and speak in here, that would be great. Thanks. Hi, good afternoon. You mentioned, Robbie, I think you mentioned that um, summer sea ice, uh, you mentioned the distinction between winter sea ice and summer sea ice, right? And, you know, if we would be in real bad shape, if the winter sea ice started to uh, to expire, I guess, or go melt. So I guess the question is, um, you know, does, you know, in Earth history, does is the Arctic region, you know, are there winter are there periods where you don't see winter sea ice? I mean, because you mentioned that it's cold in the winter, like there's typically, I just wanted like, what, what does Earth's history reveal there? I'm curious. Um, certainly, I'm not the man to answer that, but I mean, there is some fairly fundamental physics involving when, when the Earth gets dark for a long time, you just radiate a lot of uh, heat energy to just into space. And that's why, that's why like, planets in the solar system are often extremely cold because they just lose away and they don't get it back. Um, Walt, do you, do you know about a lack of winter sea ice in, in Earth history? Um, I mean, I'm not, I don't know, I probably know much more than you, but, you know, there certainly have been, you know, in the time of the dinosaurs, 
that it was really warm. The CO2 level was really high. There were ferns growing in, in the Arctic Ocean or in the Arctic, not in the Arctic Ocean. Um, so certainly back then, I, I don't have a good sense of like when the last time that might have happened. Like it was the, you know, the the, well, the like the last interglacial or I, I don't think it ever got that warm. But um, yeah, the short answer, the best I can answer anyway is yes, there definitely have been periods, but not anything recently and i don't know exactly when that was but it you know not, not in the i don't think in the ice age regime so yeah i'd, I'd say it's a matter of millions and millions of years not, yeah not, yeah not thousands no no yeah it has to just be fundamentally above above minus two uh before you stop freezing uh freezing sea ice so So I, I'm Yul Herbert from Canada, and I have a number of friends who are Inuit in the Arctic, and I'm always having arguments with them because they claim that the sea ice is not actually going down um, in the areas in which they are, and um, and they argue they argue that scientific knowledge is a different way of looking at the world than they use, and I'm just wondering to the degree to which you're looking at in different ways of looking at the world, like indigenous worldviews, and trying to understand. Um, how they're seeing the natural system versus how science is and if there are actually differences in what's happening based on our ways of perceiving the environment. Maybe that's very philosophical. But. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah, well, it's interesting that you know, you're, you're saying that the, the communities that you spoke to haven't seen change. And, and that's certainly possible, you know, because that, that just gets where, you know, I look at big satellite data and you know, big model projections and you know it doesn't really get to the local aspect um and certainly in some local areas you, you probably don't see much change in the high canadian arctic for example um you know there's ice there the the uh, archipelago region has a lot of thick multi-year ice um it doesn't you know we see trends in our data but that our data is not all that great there anyways but i have you know i have you know talked to uh, communities like in alaska where they are seeing big changes um but I think the point you make is that, you know, they do look at the ice very fundamentally differently. Um, it, you know, it's part of their culture, part of their traditions. And, you know, something like sea ice concentration or sea ice extent really doesn't mean much to them. Um, it, you know, they're looking at, is the ice safe to transit on? What What's the character of the ice? Is it spongy under their feet? Uh, you know, when does the ice break up and, and things like that, which is, you know, directly impactful. And that's kind of what I alluded to, you know, trying to connect to that. That's one of the things we're hoping to try to do with our sea ice outlooks and sea ice prediction um, for seasonal forecasts. It's a challenge. Um, we do have a group at, at the National Snow and Ice Data Center. It's called ALOCA, a project. It's an NSF-funded project, um, which I can't remember what that stands for right now, E-L-O-K-A. But they're specifically focused on uh, local and indigenous knowledge of the Arctic and, and getting oral histories and, and data uh, from them. And, um, and I think that's a really great project. Um, and, and there's a lot of great stuff coming out of that. And I think it's really important because um, I think they, they do have really great knowledge and in the oral traditions you know their 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 data records go back a lot farther than our satellite data you know that when they talk about you know my grandfather used to be able to go out in the ice and such and such and now it's different you know they're they're looking back 75 80 100 or more years um and that's far beyond our satellite data so i think there's great value i i think you know the challenge is connecting those two um, and, and that is always a challenge, but I think it's really important. Um, there was a talk here, uh, I think it was two days ago now, that kind of talked about trying to connect that. And, and it's important to, um, you know, work together with the communities. It, you know, sometimes they're seen as like almost like subjects of the scientists, you know, um, and, and obviously they don't like that, you know, where the scientists drop in and just, uh, uh, you know, take some data and, and then leave. And, you know, it, there really has to be kind of built in together. And I know there are a locus one, but there are other projects looking to do that. So, um, so I think that's a, yeah, long, sorry for the long answer, but it's a great question. I think a really important aspect of, of the changes we're seeing. I should just, I should just perhaps plug that we we will actually have some Inuit here later talking and, and giving their perspectives. I think so. Uh, do do stick around for that. Yes. 
All right, thanks for the talk. So uh, this is Yetel from the Roland Institute at Harvard. So we work on a, a glass mirror-based method to try to balance Earth's energy imbalance. So we're trying to understand what's locally at the Arctic, what's the uh, current imbalance, like in, I don't know, terawatts or, uh, I mean, the, the flux is probably yeah. like four or five uh, petawatt scale. So what's the imbalance locally for that region? Um, I'm just thinking. I've I've never I've never. It's complicated. Top of atmosphere is is where you really need to look, isn't it? And I, I'm just not qualified to give you an answer. I'm afraid. Um, yeah. Sorry. Uh, there are many techniques looking to locally freeze the Arctic. Right. So uh, locally, the, what's important is local flux difference, and that's uh, ocean transport, air transport, and radiative. So understanding, getting a number uh, on that is important. Uh, to assess the feasibility of local local freezing. So, I'm 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 definitely aware of a lot of a lot of projects like the glass beads in the Arctic. The, there yeah, are, yeah, there are projects a... to raise the reflectivity of the Arctic yeah, with with all kinds of methods. And um, the only one I've I've looked into in, in detail is the glass beads, which um, I don't want to sound too uh, abrasive, but I find it slightly horrifying the glass beads like I, I would really worry what that would do to the yeah, that's from the arctic ice project uh, led by leslie field yeah but there are several other uh, approaches which might be more benign like including uh, marine cloud planning if, uh, but uh, you know understanding the uh, the actual energetics involved uh, really help you know the engineers who are trying to actually combat the problem so you guys are in the field measuring measurements yeah uh, yeah. But, uh, the, uh, yeah so, so with, with marine cloud brightening my, my concern is that if we if we locally do that in the Arctic, uh, then we'll really strengthen the temperature difference between the poles and the, the mid latitudes, and, and, and that'll probably strengthen the jet stream. And we could really be walking into jet jet stream variability by doing that. That, that could be extremely unwanted. Um, but but also, if if we do come to use these like cloud brightening techniques, and, and we do manage to keep the Earth's temperature low at high CO two concentrations. We still do walk into a massive issue of ocean acidification, and we still do have direct impacts of CO2 that aren't necessarily captured by the temperature response. Yeah, so, that, that, that's correct. So it's a multi-factorial problem. You know? So uh, the, if you look at the time scale of the different manifestations of these uh, impacts, I think uh, the acidification problem will be, only be problematic in the uh, 2080s. So it's uh, fine then. So we have a you know it's a way to lengthen. Time scale to uh, do the transition, which is absolutely necessary. But yeah, I think Arctic is a key region to really uh, freeze. If there is a, you know, globally, so if we can understand the, the energetics better, that would really help the engineer. Yeah, for sure. Do, do you have any, anything on that? Um, yeah, not not really. I mean, I don't I don't know. No, I've I've seen some numbers, uh, which I don't know off the top of my head on the on the solar the shortwave flux imbalance and the increase due to the to the lofty ICO, the lower albedo. Um, but you also have the ocean and the atmosphere. Um, and uh, so I, I, yeah, I can't give you a, a number on that. I guess I, I would say similar to Ravi, you know, the, the geoengineering type things are, I, I tend to be somewhat skeptical of them because, you know, the feasibility of it and then um, and then the other, you know, the side effects are potentially there. The, the other thing I, I think that I, when I think about that in terms of, uh, you, you do have a lot of solar flux and, and a lot of energy in the Arctic during the summer, but in the winter, it, you know, you, you, you have not, you know, you don't have any solar input. So the energy fluxes are very different. Um, so one of the things I've seen, you know, discussed and I, you know, you might have other ideas and I'm not any expert, but you know, the, the tropics are the place to try to, to do those types of things because your impact is going to be greater there. You know, um, I saw, um, actually a student project at some point, uh, just kind of theoretical, if you just put out like white, sheets or whatever in the tropics that would reflect uh on the ocean that would you know increase your albedo um that that you know might have more of an impact than the than the, than the arctic and, and maybe less fewer side effects <laughs> uh, potentially but yeah that's really outside of my expertise uh as far as anything specific so hi um quick question can you confirm the uh baseline that you're using for the 1.5 celsius and 2 celsius uh numbers That'll be 1850 to 1900. Okay, so... Um, or maybe 1880 to 1900. Okay. Um, are you aware that the original IPCC reports used a baseline of 1750 for those numbers? 
1750 is actually 0.2 to 0.3 degrees cooler than the, the present baseline. Okay. I, I, th I think there's, a, I, I'm not an expert on, on baselines, but I certainly think there's a lot to be said for accurately characterizing baselines. Like I, th I think that's a really good point that our knowledge of, of what exactly was the global mean temperature, whether that be in 1750 or whether that be 1880 to 1900, it's kind of dubious. And we, and we, we, yeah. we, we're we really going to pay attention whether we raise to 1.5 or 1.51 or 1.49 and, and because we can monitor it so accurately now, but uh, that, that might be almost a bit spurious if we don't know, if we can't properly characterize the baseline. So I don't have an exact answer for okay. you, but. Okay, and the other question is that uh, the series uh, detectors on satellites um, indicated um, a decrease of the albedo of the Arctic from 52% to 48% over about the last two or three decades. And uh, a recent Earthshine study showed that the, av the overall albedo of the Earth decreased from about 30% to 29.5% over the last 20 or 30 years, and that would be a radiative forcing increase of 0 0.5 watts per square meter. So I guess I'm asking, um, could you, do you have a feeling for how much the albedo has changed in the Arctic in the last, say, decade? Because those those series numbers haven't been updated in about five or six years, I think. Um. I don't have a specific number on on the uh, albedo, uh, you know, exactly how much change. I mean, obviously, in the Arctic, with the uh, with the loss of sea ice in the summertime, you you you're changing, you're lowering the albedo pretty dramatically. Um, now, of course, you also have clouds, so you know your your top of atmosphere albedo, um, you know, is made perhaps offset by clouds. I I don't know specifically uh, in terms of the series data. I actually was talking to them. Um, last month actually and I, I think they're gonna they're they're working on a reprocessing so there'll be probably new data that will be refined and updated uh coming it takes a little while but um um i think that's you know that will be good to see um but i'm not familiar with series data specifically myself so yeah have we got any other questions any online okay great i think we'll wrap it up Thank, thanks for your time everyone and, uh, see you later